We wouldn't know it at the time, but the Canadian Grand Prix of 2010 would have a lasting impact on the very nature of F1 for practically the entire decade following it. The Grand Prix racing we watch today? A lot of that is born out of that one unusual race weekend in Montreal nine years ago. Here's how that came to be. 2010 seems a long time ago now, and the rules of F1 seem to be constantly on the move, so let me set the scene for you. 2010 was the first year in the current era of Formula 1 without refuelling. For the first time in a long time, F1 cars would have to start the race with enough fuel to go all the way from lights to flag. Previously, the cars would run pretty light through the whole race, stopping regularly, as often as two or three times, to refuel just enough to blast through the next stint of laps. Within this rule set, Grand Prix would be divided into sprints, effectively with the life of the tyres not being particularly challenged as they only had to last about a third of the race, so drivers would always be pushing them, with their stint length determined only by how far their fuel would take them. Removing refuelling suddenly puts the emphasis on tyre life, with race stories dominated by which cars and drivers could make their tyres last the best, and races switching pretty uniformly to a one-stop strategy, with drivers able to take their still fairly robust tyres easily over half distance, whichever compound they were on. Back then, each driver had to use two different sets of tyre compounds during the race, mandating a pit stop, but only two compounds were brought to each event instead of the three we see today. Bridgestone, in their final year of supplying F1 with tyres, saw no particular need to change up their tyre philosophy from years previous and kept with a robust tyre that could be pushed without too much concern. That was until we got to Canada. At the circuit Gilles Villeneuve, the teams in Bridgestone were suddenly thrown into disarray. On top of the several sections of track being resurfaced since the last Grand Prix in 2008, the temperatures across the Friday and Saturday were a lot lower than expected. And the result was quite severe tyre degradation as the rubber struggled to get up to optimum temperature. This was particularly acute with the super soft tyre, but the harder, medium compound was struggling too. The normal, fairly conservative approach to tyre strategy was out the window. Bridgestone suspected two or even three stops needing to come into play on race day. This suddenly made qualifying very interesting. In 2010, those that made it through to Q3 would have to start the race on whichever tyre they set their fastest lap with in that final qualifying session, as opposed to today when the Q2 compound gets taken through to the race. The championship in 2010 was a broad, open fight between the McLarens, the Ferraris and the Red Bulls, with no one team or driver looking to have a distinct advantage. In qualifying, Lewis Hamilton secured pole for McLaren on the super soft tyres, but both Red Bulls decided to run on the medium compound, ending up 2nd and 7th on the grid after Mark Webber took his 5th place penalty. The similarly competitive Alonso and Button in the Ferrari and McLaren respectively sat comfortably on the 2nd row, but it was all looking very good for Red Bull, who were able to start on the harder tyre, whereas McLaren and Ferrari would use the super soft when the car was at its heaviest. The softer rubber would surely be toast within a handful of laps while Red Bull could wait to strap on their super softs once their cars had burned through the fuel. Everyone outside the top 10 who had free choice of tyres also opted to start on the harder medium. Race day was hotter than it had been the rest of the weekend, no one was really sure how the tyres would behave under some decent summer sunlight, but as predicted the softs burned away almost immediately. The race was 70 laps long, but Button came in on lap 6 followed by Hamilton and Alonso on lap 7, with Alonso managing to pass Hamilton by the tightest of margins in the pit lane. But the mediums didn't last nearly as long as expected. Kubica, the only other driver in the top 10 to have started on the harder compound, was already in the pits on lap 9. The Red Bulls went further, but not by much. Weber came in on lap 13 to grab another set of mediums, and Vettel followed a lap later, but swapped to the super softs. It looked like Red Bull were very unsure of themselves at this point. Hamilton actually managed to repass Alonso on track for the lead and managed to hold position in front of him when they stopped on laps 26 and 28 respectively. Vettel and Button also stopped in the lap in between, meaning that Vettel, like Alonso and the McLarens, had done one stint apiece on each compound and was now on the medium, hoping to go to the end. Meanwhile, Mark Webber had inherited the lead on his second set of mediums and really needed to make these tyres last until he reached a stage where he was confident he could take a set of softs to the end. So, by the halfway point we had Weber leading, having taken just one stop so far, but being already on lap 22 of his second set of mediums when he only took the first set 13 laps in. We had Hamilton, Button and Alonso all battling for what was currently second place, having done two stops each and hoping not to stop again. These three were cutting into Weber's lead with every lap. Vettel, having tried a reverse strategy to everyone else, was back in alignment with Hamilton, Alonso and Button, but well behind by this point. But even he was baffled by this. He had to ask his engineer if he had to overtake the cars ahead to win the race. And yes, they were genuinely ahead of him on track through strategy. 
it was not what the team expected to happen. By lap 49, Hamilton and Alonso finally caught up to Webber, with Hamilton taking the lead on track and Alonso getting past the lap later when Webber relented and took his final stop. With the Red Bulls dropping back to manage some issues, it now looked like it was Alonso versus Hamilton for the lead, the two having battled closely all race long. But Alonso started to fade at this point and slipped into the hands of Jensen Button, a driver notorious for being able to keep his tyres alive and fighting for longer. So Button took that second place and secured a McLaren 1-2, with the Red Bulls having looked potentially the strongest on paper, only managing to creep home in fourth and fifth. This result kept the championship on its feet and was lauded as a wonderful, exciting mix of strategy, on-track action, driver skill, and enough mystery to keep both teams and spectators guessing from start to finish. This sparked ideas in the minds of the higher-ups. As previously mentioned, 2010 would be Bridgestone's last year supplying the sport. A new contract with Pirelli was announced just two weeks after the Canadian Grand Prix, with the Italian tyre manufacturer being very clear on what they had been asked to do. Pirelli boss Paul Henry said, We want to create a show. As a fan, Canada was great fun watching the strategy. Others say, not so good for the tyre company. We can happily make the tyres last the whole race with no degradation, but we need to balance that with the show. Now, overall, the 2010 tyres had not been very well liked. There was a lot of frustration among drivers of not being able to get them into working temperature range consistently, with even Michael Schumacher, one of the most experienced and certainly the most successful driver on the grid, saying, The tyres are a puzzle that is very difficult to work out. Often it changes from day to day. This, coupled with the somewhat simple and predictable one-stop strategies witnessed through 2010, meant Pirelli, under guidance from F1 and the FIA, made some key design decisions when constructing their 2011 tyres. They were asked to make the tyres demonstrably less durable than in 2010, when the cars could literally on occasion go the entire race distance without stopping if needed. This was shown by Vettel, who only stopped on the very last lap of the Italian Grand Prix to meet the mandatory tyre change requirements. Paul Henry emphasised that he expected to see many more races requiring at least two stops with the higher wear rate engineered into the tyres. Almost as if to preempt the raised eyebrows to come, he stated that they could make them last the whole season. But we also want entertaining races. So along came 2011, and as it shook out, McLaren were pretty hard on their tyres, which worked well in cooler conditions as it kept them well heated, but they suffered on hotter race weekends. Conversely, Ferrari were pretty easy on their tyres, so favoured the hotter temperatures, but struggled in the cold. Red Bull, meanwhile, managed to find that nice sweet spot and had a handle on the 2011 Pirellis almost everywhere. That first round in Australia really showed that Pirelli had delivered on their promise. Only one driver, Sergio Perez at his Sauber, managed to complete the race on just one pit stop. Everyone else had to take two or three stops, exactly as Pirelli were asked. And this is a trend that continued throughout the year, with two stops being the norm for most races. At first, people were quite delighted. There were more varied strategies. Cars would end up together on track with different compounds or levels of tyre deg, which led to more unpredictable results and a lot more overtaking. The overtaking levels are somewhat obscured by the introduction of DRS, but the average number of overtakes in dry conditions shot up from 21 overtakes a race in 2010 to 59 overtakes a race in 2011. Pirelli deliberately created very aggressive and difficult tyres to manage, bringing a new element to managing tyres both at a technical and driver level. 2012 brought seven different race winners in the opening seven races, something that tyres had a lot to do with as the balance of power shifted dramatically from track to track as teams and drivers had to learn quickly how to get best out of the tyres at each track. But was the aggressive, faster degrading tyre all good? Complaints began rolling in that races were becoming too tyre focused and people were talking about little else. The way tyres degraded was described as having a cliff edge, whereby the tyre would suddenly lose all drivability instead of a slow, predictable degradation. In the 2011 Belgian Grand Prix, Red Bull got themselves into a mess where they had blistered the tyres earlier in the weekend to the point where they were incredibly concerned they wouldn't be able to survive the race distance, pointing an angry finger at Pirelli. But Pirelli simply pointed out that Red Bull had ignored their strong recommendations on tyre camber limits. Teams ignoring Pirelli's recommendations for safe running could be something of a running theme these opening years of Pirelli's partnership, to the point where the rules had to be changed to make sure teams stuck to Pirelli's suggested tyre pressure windows. There was quite the back and forth. In China in 2012, Kimi Raikkonen's tyres hit the cliff so dramatically towards the end of the race that he dropped from 2nd to 12th in just over one lap. 
But the real death knell for this aggressive Pirelli tyre was the 2013 British Grand Prix, where a series of fairly alarming tyre failures across the whole field saw Pirelli cross the line from entertaining mavericks to embarrassing rubber clowns. From there, and particularly with the advent of a more demanding, talky hybrid power unit in 2014, Pirelli backed up into a more conservative, robust approach to tyre compounds, and the sport slipped back into a standard one-stop routine once more. But tyre degradation remained a key part of race strategies nonetheless. Unfortunately, it meant degradation would still bite away at tyre life, but in a way that made it more advantageous to drive easy keeping tyres more or less alive for as long as possible rather than push harder and take more pit stops. It was faster overall to drive slowly and take one less pit stop than go all out and swap your rubber more frequently. Strategy variation dried up and with it the overtaking and on-track battles dwindled. Fighting just wasn't worth the effort as it could wreck your tyres and put you in a worse position even if you managed to get track position. It's impossible to create the all-out, push-every-lap sprints of the refuelling area through tyres alone, as tyres that can be pushed indefinitely will, by definition, not need replacing at pit stops, so you'll always wind up with one-stop racing or short-life tyres. Pirelli keep degradation built into their design to allow for some variation in strategy between teams aiming for more two-stop races, but at least hoping for some different approaches as one-stop races continue to occur. Refuelling, of course, is not the answer. When refuelling was removed in 2010, the on-track overtakes doubled from 2009, as previously cars would just overtake through the pit stop phases, not actually making manoeuvres on track. Pirelli continue to this day to try and find that fine line where the tyre life and degradation could feed into mixed up strategies and strong races without tyres failing or suddenly dropping off a cliff. But, as with many things, the solution will ultimately lie in removing the overarching dirty air problem that makes it so hard for cars to follow one another and wrecks the rubber of chasing cars. Once cars can get close and have a go and follow each other, it will matter less and less how fast the tyres degrade, or perhaps if we even need pit stops at all. Imagine that.